In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. <laughs> Then, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now, you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Gather round, my friends. I have a story that I want to tell you. My name is Zachariah. Have you ever had trouble with talking too much? Well, that was a problem that I once had. You know, it's kind of a, a problem with us religious types. I mean, we can talk and talk and talk, and it always seems as if we think anyways that we've got things that people need to hear. You know, my name, Zachariah, it means Yahweh remembers. And I know it's a, a very good name, isn't it? I've reflected often on the fact that God remembers, and yet sometimes I have wondered. As many of you probably already know, I had a wonderful wife whose name was Elizabeth. She was quite a partner for me, and we enjoyed being married, except for the fact that we had no children. Perhaps it is something that you can only fully understand if you or someone who you know and love have been unable to have children. If you haven't struggled with this or don't know of anyone who has, let me just explain what it's like. In our culture, anyways, when you are childless, it's a, a sign that you're living an unacceptable life. 
It means that you've been doing something wrong and that God is in some way displeased with you. And believe me, we've tried to obey God's command to be fruitful and multiply. But for whatever reason, that door has remained closed to us. Elizabeth and I prayed long and hard on this subject, but our prayers were not answered. In fact, the heavens seemed strangely silent whenever we would pray about the issue. All of our friends around us were, were having children, and all we could do is watch them from afar, wishing that their joy could also be our joy. Of course, all our friends reminded us of Abraham and Sarah like we had somehow forgotten that story. It's like we didn't know this story. But frankly, when you're the age that we had become, why even bother to hope for that anymore? We would often remind ourselves that at our age, children were a little bit more than what we probably had the energy for anyways. Abraham and Sarah were one of those old stories. I believe it to be true. I guess I just wasn't sure that God even chose to work that way anymore. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I, I hadn't given up on God. I was devoted to God. We were devoted to God. And we did everything we possibly could to be right with God. We obeyed God's commandments. We, when we sinned, we offered the appropriate sacrifices in the temple. We were part of, of synagogue life. In every way, we wanted to be in a right relationship with our God. And as much as humanly possible, we were working to be in tune with the plan that he had for us. But one day, I discovered that God was not done with us, not by a long shot. Though I had, in a way, thought that the Lord was pretty much done with us, especially since we were old, too old humanly to have kids anyways. But what Elizabeth and I found out was that God had been planning things for us for a long time. You see, apparently, I was chosen. Let me explain Twice a day, a priest goes into the temple to offer incense in the Holy of Holies. How one was chosen was by lot. In other words, it was not some kind of political thing. It wasn't who you knew or anything like that. It was God that chose you. And it was literally a once-in-a-lifetime event. And once you did it, you never did it again. And since there were over 20,000 of us in the land at the time, I mean, many never even had the privilege to go into this most sacred place. To be chosen, you know, well, it was a, a great blessing and it was a tremendous honor. So when I was chosen, it was almost like a vindication of sorts. To others, it had always appeared that Elizabeth and I were doing something wrong. And since we didn't have children, it was a sign that God was withholding from us this tremendous blessing. And it wasn't just those around us that were thinking this. I mean, we wondered about it too. Yet here I am. I was chosen to go into the Holy of Holies. This was so phenom phenomenal. I can never express to you the excitement that I felt when I found out it was so unbelievable and a sign to me that God was still open to blessing us. As the time came, I, I rehearsed the actions over and over and over again. I was going into the very presence of God. I was going into the place where his glory dwelt. I thought about what I would do, the offering of the incense. I thought about what I would say, the, the prayers that were to be made. And so the time came. I was participating in the prescribed ritual. Now, now, don't get me wrong here. I meant everything I was doing. I meant everything that I was saying. And I was praying for the coming Messiah, the redemption of Israel. And oh, how I had longed for this. If only God would send us a savior. If God would only free us from this terrible tyranny. If God would only free us from the oppression that we have brought upon ourselves. 
I would pray, oh God, come and work in us and for us and save us from our enemies. By the way, have you ever prayed for an angel? I mean, have you ever felt that your situation was so desperate that you needed God to send one of his messengers to intervene? I mean, we all pray, and as God just give me a sign. Have you prayed that? We all pray that. Well, it's not as easy as it looks, my friends. You see, there I was praying for God's intervention. And what happens? God intervenes. Gabriel showed up unexpectedly, I might add. I was more than just startled. I was scared. I was really scared. I was terrified. I mean, there's a, a reason why angels so often tell people, do not be afraid. It's because they are frightening. Have you ever seen an angel? They are like, well, they're very hard to describe. They are bright and they are about this tall and probably about this wide. Well, that doesn't do justice to describing them either. I mean, he just kind of filled the room and an angel just kind of fills the space with his presence. And they are, well, you, you just have to understand that they're very hard to describe. All I can tell you is that when you see one, you know that you have seen one. I was petrified and of course, as I look back on it now, I understand that God was answering my prayer. At the time, though, it seemed like some great big mistake. Gabriel told me that Elizabeth and I, that, that we were going to have a son. Gabriel told me that he was going to be a Nazarite and thus uniquely different. And Gabriel told me that he was going to be purely set apart for God's work and service. He also told me that, and, and this one took my breath away, he told me that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit right from the very beginning, right from the time that he was inside Elizabeth. Gabriel also told me that he would have a very special mission, that he would help to bring people back to God. Now, before you start thinking that uh, I'm just a crazy old man, I want you to remember that, one, I was petrified. Two, I was being told that I was going to be a father. And if you were me, I'm not sure that you would have believed it either. But I confess to you, I didn't believe it. I kept thinking to myself, well, this is all really nice. In fact, this is really great. But are you sure you have the right people? Maybe you were supposed to see tomorrow's priest. Maybe he made a mistake and came a day early. Maybe this was a message for a much younger man. But, you know, it was true. I was faithless. I thought I was too old. I thought Elizabeth was too old. Old people don't have children. Too many years have passed by. Our fruitful years were long gone, and we had learned to just simply accept it. So then, uh, I said the dumbest thing I've ever said. I said to Gabriel, God's messenger, how can I be sure? You know, I, I don't think Gabriel was very impressed with my answer, and I, I guess I can't blame him. When I should have been praising God for answering my prayer, all I could think to do was to question it. In fact, Gabriel shot back with something, and he stated it so firmly that I think he might have been angry with me. He said, I come from God with this good news. And you know, that did kind of sum it up. That did kind of say it all. This was not a time for me to be arguing or for me to be doubting. But I found out rather quickly that it was too late to take back my doubts and my faithlessness. It was already out in the open. And I learned something that day. In fact, I learned a lesson that I'm hoping that everyone who is hearing my voice now and hearing my story can learn maybe even those of you who are watching this now. 
For if you are here today and are not a follower of the one true God, that is, if you are a doubter about what God is doing, then you need to understand this, is that disbelief really has nothing to say. As I mentioned, Gabriel was not too pleased with my questioning, so my judgment came quick, way too quick. And for the next nine months, I was told that I would have nothing to say. And what Gabriel did was really a mute point, if you will pardon my pun. And this was, for me, a very hard lesson to learn. I mean, I was a teacher of the law. I was a talker by trade. So to not say anything, well, it was very difficult for me. It was like the longest timeout ever for being bad. But you know what? It did give me a lot of time to think, and it did give me a lot of time to watch Elizabeth grow. What a sight, and how she glowed, and how we laughed. I mean, for me, it was, wasn't out loud, but I laughed anyways. And we did laugh together. And why did we laugh? <laughs> because God is gracious. I discovered that our impossibilities are excellent platforms for God to do his work. Do you believe that? That our impossibilities are excellent platforms for God to do his work. He is working in all of us, and if we're willing to see it, he has tremendous good in mind, even though we might think that he has given up on us. He never gives up. He never gives up on us, and he is always working. And sometimes we just need to get out of the way. This is at least one of the reasons the Lord set aside my ability to speak. I was getting in the way. I was doubting. I was being faithless. It was like he was saying, I need to use you. Now just get out of the way. It's rather paradoxical, don't you think? But it speaks to a, a greater truth that I learned during my period of silence. That is, Sometimes we just need to be quiet. And there's a lot to learn in si silence. But nowadays, you hardly live in a culture that values that. It's more than just being quiet. It's valuing silence. It's using the silence. It's listening to God, and it's listening for God. And I wonder how many times you come into this room this sanctuary, this auditorium, and just simply go through the motions. You walk in, you sit down, you greet others. You stand up, you sing, you sit down, you stand up, you sing. You sit down, you stand up, you read scripture, you sing. You sit down, you stand up, you sing, and then you walk out. And yet when you come, you come into a place that is designed to meet with God. But you never plan on it. We never plan on meeting God here. We go through the motions, but we really miss the reality. You know, that is what happened to me. I was so wrapped up in the blessing of being chosen to go into the temple that I wasn't listening. And if God hadn't intervened, I would have missed that God had something far greater, far superior than I could ever imagine. So what did I learn? I learned that silence was a gift, that being quiet is sometimes a, a holy response, an appropriate response to our Holy Father in heaven. And in that silence, I discovered something else. I believed. Believe me, I believed. For when my son was born, I had no trouble naming him. It was the name God had given him. His name was John, meaning God has been gracious. For God had not only been gracious to me, but he was also being gracious to all of you and to the world. My son, I believe you've heard of him. His name is John the Baptist. He would be the messenger that would prepare the way for the coming Messiah. And although I didn't understand this at the time, God was answering my very prayer that night in the temple. And all I had to do was just be quiet. <laughs>